The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. A good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. A hired man who is not a shepherd and whose sheep are not his own sees a wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. The wolf catches and scatters them. This is because he works for pay and has no concern for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know mine and mine know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I will lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. These also I must lead, and they will hear my voice. There will be one flock of one shepherd. This is why the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own. I have power to lay it down and power to take it up again. This command I received from my Father. The Gospel of the Lord. This weekend, I'm going to be doing three things that in almost 24 years of being a deacon, I've never done before. And hopefully, when I'm done, it'll make some sense and you'll get something out of it. The first thing I'm going to do is preach out here in the open, so to speak. Always before this, I've preached from the safety and protection of the ambo. So today, my only hope is that it will be hard to hit the moving target. And that, there's a reason for that I'm being out here too, and I'll get to that in a minute. The second thing is that I'm gonna talk about myself. When we were in formation, we were taught, it's about Jesus, talk about Jesus, just about Jesus, not about yourself. But today, I ask for your patience and indulgence because I'm talking a little bit about myself. And again, it has to do with the gospel and the message today. And the third thing I'll get to in a minute is it all ties together. But to begin with, let me tell you a couple of little stories by myself. When I was growing up in Ohio, it was that kind of, our house was out in the country a little bit, and there was a stream behind our house and some woods, and behind that there was a farmer's field, a cornfield, a pretty good sized one, and then on the other side there was a farmer. He really wasn't a farmer per se, because he had a full-time job that wasn't farming, but he did have this field where he had some pine trees little Christmas trees where you'd go in and cut your own Christmas tree, give them the money and so on. In that field, he also had some, some sheep, had a flock of sheep. When I was about 10 or 12 years old, my friends and I decided we'd go over and scare the sheep. And we'd jump out from behind the pine trees and chase them a little bit and they'd run and scatter like mad and we thought it was all fun and games until, of course, being a small town, pretty quickly, found out who was scaring the sheep and we got in trouble for it, and rightly so. Fast forward to about 17, 15 years ago, when I used to do some archery elk hunting up behind Vail on the north side of I-70 there, and when you hunt up there, there's one thing you had to, to know was that there was a, a shepherd up there, a true shepherd. He camped out with his sheep all year round practically, and the reason why you had to know about it was because he had these two dogs. And they looked like a combination of a wolf and a bear. They were huge and they were ferocious and vicious. And I don't care what kind of dog whisperer, dog friendly person you think you are, these dogs didn't care, they would attack you. They only answered to their master. And so you didn't want to get mess around with the dogs. And you didn't want to mess around with the, the shepherd either because he was armed to the hilt. He had two sidearms, a rifle, a shotgun, a knife, everything. And he wanted to be left alone. He wanted to protect his sheep. Now, obviously, this is kind of a real-life real examples of 
a good shepherd and a hired hand. But I want to focus more so on the sheep. Because over the years when I've thought about this, when I read the Good Shepherd Gospel, I think about the sheep and the sheep that my friends and I had scared. After a while, they wouldn't come out of the barn too far. Or if they did, they wouldn't stay together with each other and they would eat a little bit and then look up and move around. They're real skittish. The shepherd's sheep, we looked up on the hill, they're all calm and together and just grazing. They never really looked up, they just grazed peacefully, laid down, whatever. And it was like as if the sheep just knew they were protected. You know, I don't believe sheep can trust because it's an animal, it's more like instinct. It's his prerogative. And he's blessed me and given me the privilege and honor to talk about money also in, in this homily. And part of the reason why I'm standing out here versus at the Ambo is because I'm somewhat in the middle. I have a different perspective. Because there are some things which I'm the same as Father Daniel and Father Micah, there's things that I'm different. There's things that I am the same as you all, and there's things that I'm different. One of the things that I am the same as Father Micah and Father Daniel is that I'm ordained clergy, just like they are. We've, all three of us have been ordained. So that sacramentally, sacramentally, let me say it in one more time, sacramentally, we are the same, identical. We've all received holy orders. We are the same as every other deacon, priest, or bishop, including the Bishop of Rome, that is the Pope. We're all even. We were ordained, we are ordained, and now we become what we are ordained. I am a deacon. I'm not just up here deaconing, doing deacon things. Father's not over there priesting or sleeping or doing priestly things. He's a priest. Father Daniel's a priest. I'm a deacon. That's who we are. That's our vocation. That's our life. Okay. It becomes important to understand that when we start thinking about what we do with our vocation in our life. Part of the difference is that magisterially in the church, there's a difference between a deacon, a priest, and a bishop. I'm here to support my priest. The pastor, Father Daniel's, here to support you all with the assistance of Father Michael. Micah. Sorry. And Father Daniel, as a pastor, has an obligation to support this parish because he's a steward of it. And I've been surprised how candid he has been with his discussion of money. He's still thinking how much he makes, how he struggled with money before, how his job is recession-proof, how he's always have a job kind of thing, which is amazing. You know, I'm a little bit di different than him in that I do not get paid by the archdiocese. I don't get paid by the parish. So anything you give is not going to come to me. And I don't need money, I, I have a job, okay? I'm not asking for money, unless somebody wants to give me a million dollars and I'll retire early. But other than that, no, I don't need money. And when I came here, I give money here, because this is my new family, my new home, okay? But for Father, he's so open with everything, you might begin to wonder, well, what does he know about, you know, you know giving money or not, and whether it makes a difference or not? Well, that's where, I'm a little different from Father, Father Micah and Father Daniel, and I'm the same as you all, many of you all anyway, and I have another vocation, and that is I'm married. Okay. I've been married for almost 38 years and to a wonderful wife named Judy, and she sacrificed so much so I could be a deacon, but also I'm her husband. I'm also a father. Just like many of you all, when you get married, that's who you are, not what you do. You know, you don't just do husband things and wife things and that's it. That's who you become. That's part of your vocation now. And because of that, you might think, well, yeah, I know how to take care of a family. I know how to protect things. You know, what does father know? Well, do you want to fail at being a father or a mother as far as protecting and, and providing for your family? That's your vocation, that's who you are. The same for Father, he does not want to fail. 
But it's more than just not wanting to fail. It's also about why do you do what you do? You protect your family, you provide for your family out of love, out of love. And Father Daniel has told you that he loves you. He's done this several times. You know, just like our own family, we love our own family, even if it's difficult. You know? And I know already that you all can be a handful at times as a family, but Father Daniel still loves you. He wants the best for you, he wants to provide for you. Just like you want to provide for your own family and what you do. Now there's times when it can be very difficult, you know, but we still give, we still sacrifice. I know we've all given a gift at one time or other to somebody who was so very grateful for it. They just gushed over with, you know, gratitude. And they talk about it every time they see you kind of thing. And giving that gift out of love made you feel better. It gave you life. Giving out of love gives us life. Not out of obligation or just because we have to, but giving out of love gives us life. You don't expect anything back from it either. The same goes with the church. The church's giving is not transactional. It's not like when you go to the grocery store or retail store, you give them some money and you expect to take whatever you, you bought and go home and use it, whatever. Church isn't like that. It's not like you've seen those vending machines where they have, you know, the, the potato chips and the cookies and the crackers or whatever. You put your money in. It's okay, I want that. So it's at E6 or whatever and so on. You know, it's not like you come to the church and put your money in and say, well, I'm having a tough day, so I need the virtue of perseverance. Let's see, that's it. You know, F6, whatever. No, it doesn't work that way. There's no expectation or obligation for anybody who walks through those doors to give anything at all, ever. But the church will always give. It will always be here to give for you, to provide for your material needs in the sense of a building, and especially your spiritual needs. And as Father Daniel has mentioned before, even if this all went away, you still have the priesthood. The church will still exist. Look back to the history of the church. It will always be here. But it needs to be provided for at times and it can be very hard I know to provide for for your own family at times as well as for others one other story about myself my wife and I early on in our marriage we decided we're going to write the check to God first always every month and there was times when we lived paycheck to paycheck there was one time in particular I remember when I was working for General Dynamics in San Diego and they got bought out by Martin Marietta. Some of you may know about this at the time. And so for about eight or nine months, I go to work. And I didn't know if I had a job the next day. Because every day, they were handing out layoff notices, you know, pink slips to walk out the door papers. Every day. They didn't wait till Friday. They didn't wait till the first of the month. It was every day. And so it's kind of tough. And then in the middle of it, my wife comes home and says, um, I'm pregnant with our third child. I look at her and says, what? How'd this happen? Duh. <laughs> anyway. And, but through all that, we trusted in God. He said, God, it's all yours now. I don't know what's going to happen. And long story short, everything worked out. And this is not to say how great I am or how good I am and how trusting I am or anything like that. I'm not a saint. Just ask anybody who knows me, especially my wife and children. But it's to say how great God is. I'm certain that all of you could tell me a story where there was a time in your life where things weren't going so good and all of a sudden something showed up. Some check from some insurance claim or some something or other or somebody just out of the blue did something for you and took care of you. They did it out of love or whatever. Or God did it because he loves you. And that's the whole point about the money. If you don't worry about the money and let God worry about it, then you become much more free, much more life-giving. Money is not your God. God is your God, and he will take care of us. There's no doubt about that. I think if we all reflect on our lives, we'll know that. 
just a matter of do we trust. And as our lives change and things happen, our situations change, but God does not. You know, he's always there for us. You know, finally, is the only thing we need to remember, too, lastly, is that as St. John says, look how much love God has bestowed on us. Because we are truly, truly his beloved children. And he's a true great father. He'll never forget us or abandon us, but always protect us. Praise be Jesus Christ.